Welcome to section 5 of Immunology. In this section, we'll be discussing the complement system. This is the overview image for acute inflammation. We introduced complement activation briefly in section 2. And so now we're going to basically zoom up on this process and tell you what you need to know for step 1. The complement system is composed of plasma proteins that are synthesized in the liver. And when activated, these proteins will form complexes that will complement acute inflammation. For example, C5A will upregulate neutrophil chemotaxis, C5A and C3A will upregulate mast cell degranulation. And those are two examples that we've already discussed in section 2. But I bring them up again here to help reinforce the term complement, in that the complement system complements acute inflammation. Now what you need to know about the complement system largely revolves around the parts of the system that intersect with pathology. In other words, if one part of the complement system goes wrong or is deficient, how will that impact a patient clinically? Now there are three possible ways to initiate the complement system. One is the spontaneous pathway, also called the alternative pathway. There's also the lectin pathway and the classic pathway. Now it's easy to get lost in the weeds of all three of these pathways, but what you need to know is that all three pathways lead to the formation of a C3 convertase. So here's the general flow of the complement system. C3 convertase is formed, then C5 convertase is formed, and then the membrane attack complex is formed, abbreviated MAC. And the membrane attack complex is really important for the lysis of encapsulated bacteria. This diagram demonstrates the complement system. And again, there are three ways to trigger the complement system, which you can see with these red boxes. There's the classic pathway, the lectin pathway, and the spontaneous or alternative pathway. All three pathways ultimately lead to the creation of a C3 convertase. Now you will likely come across complement diagrams that grossly overcomplicate this process. For example, you may learn that the classic and lectin pathways lead to the creation of C4B2B, which is a C3 convertase whereas the alternative, or spontaneous pathway, leads to the creation of C3B-BB, which is also a C3 convertase. Now those are extraneous details, and I highly recommend not wasting your time on those. What you need to know is that all pathways lead to a C3 convertase, and once created, C3 convertase will take C3 and convert it to C3A and C3B. So C3 got split into two parts, C3A and C3B. C3A can then go and stimulate mast cell degranulation, something we discussed in section two. And C3B actually has two roles. One is to act as an opsonin and upregulate opsonization. And recall, that just means that it helps phagocytes phagocytose their pathogens. The second role of C3B is to lead to the formation of a C5 convertase, which you can see here. C5 convertase is very similar to C3 convertase in that it takes C5 and cleaves it into C5A and C5B. C5A will act just like C3A and stimulate mast cell degranulation, but it also has a second role of upregulating neutrophil chemotaxis. Now let's move on to C5B. This will combine with C6 through C9 complement proteins, and together they will form the membrane attack complex, which you can see here. The membrane attack complex will form on the surface of pathogens and cause pathogen lysis. Another detail you need to know about the membrane attack complex is that it can also form on RBCs, and it can actually cause red blood cell lysis. Thankfully, our body has a way to prevent this from occurring, and that is through two surface proteins called membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis, or MERL, as well as decay accelerating factor, or DAF, DAF. As illustrated here, these proteins will combat the membrane attack complex on the red blood cell membrane and prevent red blood cell lysis. As I mentioned before, some of the most important things for you to remember about the complement system is how it intersects with pathology. And you can see these intersections by looking at the right portion of the image, which lists five pathologies. Each one of these numbers corresponds to a number on the diagram. For example, C1 inhibitor deficiency corresponds to this portion right here of the diagram. Here we've written C1 esterase inhibitor, but you may see C1 inhibitor, which is how we referred to it in the previous section when discussing the kinin system. We will now dive into these diseases on a new table. This table lists the diseases related to the complement system. Let's start with early complement deficiencies. This involves complement proteins C1, C2, or C4. Now let's describe the problem. This is a group of diseases characterized by a deficiency in one or more early complement proteins. So moving on to the description, this ultimately means that there's a failure to lyse encapsulated organisms, which makes sense. 
If you don't have the first portion of the complement system, then you wouldn't get that latter portion of the complement system, which is the formation of the membrane attack complex. So in early complement deficiencies, patients can have recurrent infections of encapsulated bacteria, such as Haemophilus influenza type B, strep pneumonia, and Neisseria meningitidis. But there's another problem that these patients can get, and it centers around the fact that C1, C2, and C4 proteins are all required to clear immune complexes. This results in immune complex persistence, which can lead to lupus. So patients with early complement deficiencies have a high risk of developing lupus. Going back to the diagram, you can see early complement deficiencies listed here. And this refers generically to the complement pathway prior to the formation of C3 convertase. So everything from this point and above. So if you can't form C3 convertase, you don't get MAC. And so you can't really kill encapsulated organisms. So these patients get recurrent infections with H flu, type B, strep pneumo, and Neisseria meningitidis. And once more, these early complement proteins are also needed to clear out immune complexes. And without that ability, these patients can get lupus. Now let's dive into late or terminal complement deficiencies. These can take the form of a C3 deficiency or any of the proteins from C5 to C9. So we can call this a group or category of diseases, just like early complement deficiencies. But the point is, is that there's a deficiency somewhere. And this leads to a failure to lyse encapsulated organisms, which, much like early complement deficiencies, leads to recurrent infections of encapsulated bacteria. But here's where late complement deficiencies differ from early complement deficiencies. Because in late deficiencies, you're really only concerned with Neisseria infections, not so much H flu or strep pneumo. So we can see late or terminal complement deficiencies written here, and this generically refers to anything from the C3 convertase and onward. Once again, in these patients, MAC won't be formed, you won't be able to lyse encapsulated organisms, but you're really only concerned with Neisseria infections. Now, the reason they don't get strep pneumo or H flu type B infections is not perfectly clear. So I'm going to stress this again. The main clinical outcome of late complement deficiencies is infections with Neisseria meningitidis. Next, let's discuss the consequences of splenectomy. So here's the problem. Without a spleen, there's decreased macrophage phagocytosis of pathogens. Secondly, there's decreased IgM synthesis, which is normally required to fix complement via the classical pathway. So as you can see, there are two reasons the spleen is necessary for clearing out encapsulated organisms. Because the spleen normally is a major site of macrophage phagocytosis of encapsulated organisms, as well as IgM synthesis. So without a spleen, patients will lose those splenic macrophages, so they won't be able to kill encapsulated organisms, and there's a loss of IgM-mediated complement fixation, which leads, again, to decreased MAC, so decreased ability to destroy encapsulated organisms. So how do these patients present? Well, as you'd expect, with recurrent infections of encapsulated organisms, such as H flu type B, strep pneumo, and Neisseria meningitidis. And those infections are intuitive. It's very similar to those infections found in early complement deficiencies. So with a splenectomy, you can see that there will be decreased IgM fixation, so decreased classic pathway activation. That, plus the lack of splenic macrophages, results in infections with encapsulated organisms. Again, that would be H flu type B, strep pneumo, and Neisseria meningitidis. So splenectomy and early complement deficiencies are very similar. However, patients with splenectomy don't have an increase of developing lupus, which makes sense. After all, they're able to actually form the proteins that should clear out immune complexes, whereas early complement deficiencies don't have that. Now let's briefly discuss hereditary angioedema. This is caused by a C1 inhibitor deficiency. The description, as shown here, and the clinical notes, as shown here, are all discussed in detail in the previous video on the kinin system. Those details are reiterated here just for the sake of completeness of this table. However, we won't rehash those details again here. In fact, I really just want you to see visually how the complement system intersects with the kinin system. We see C1 inhibitor right here, and this will upregulate the degradation of bradykinin to degraded bradykinin. So that's its role in the kinin system. And this table shows its role in the complement system. How this normally functions is to inhibit C1 esterase. C1 esterase converts C1 to activated C1, and the downstream effect is ultimately to create C4. So if a patient has a C1 inhibitor deficiency, and we block this off here, then you would expect increased bradykinin, as we discussed in the previous video. With increased C1 esterase activity, you'd expect more activation of the classic pathway, more C3 convertase, more C5 convertase, and potentially overactivation of complement and perhaps some diseases. However, 
this does not happen. In other words, patients with C1 esterase inhibitor deficiency, or C1 inhibitor deficiency, really only get symptoms from the deficiency as it relates to the kinin system, not as it relates to the complement system. Now let's discuss paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. This disease is caused by an inability to prevent complement-mediated red blood cell lysis. Now moving on to the description, red blood cells normally prevent formation of MAC on their surface, and they do this through DAF, also called CD55, and MURO, also called CD59. Both of these proteins are anchored to the surface of the red blood cell through GPI proteins. And when there's a mutation in the pig A gene, this results in a lack of GPI anchor proteins, which means there's nothing to hold the DAF or CD55 proteins and the MURO or CD59 proteins to the red blood cell surface. This means there's no way to inhibit the formation of MAC on the red blood cell surface, which means the red blood cells will lyse. Ultimately, this results in anemia, decreased haptoglobin, and dark urine. Going back to this image, you can see that normally, MERL and DAF will inhibit RBC lysis, but when this system fails, these patients will get paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or PNH. This image demonstrates this idea. This is the red blood cell membrane, and we can see CD59 right here, also called MERL, and CD55 right here, also called DAF. As a quick review, do you remember what DAF stands for? Decay Accelerating Factor. What about MERL? That stands for Membrane Inhibitor of Reactive Lysis. So again, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria results from a pig A gene deficiency, or mutation, which leads to a deficiency in GPI protein, which means there's no way to anchor these important proteins. Therefore, complement on the red blood cell surface will be unregulated and unfettered, and these red blood cells will lyse. So going back to this table, regarding PNH, when these patients sleep, their respiration decreases, and this causes their blood to experience a mild acidosis. And this mild acidosis supposedly activates complement, leading to increased red blood cell lysis at night while the patient is asleep. So when they wake up, they get hemoglobinuria, or dark urine. But truthfully, these patients can have hemoglobinuria at any time of day. But I just wanted you to know at least where the name comes from. So paradoxically, they have hemoglobinuria overnight. Now that we've covered the complement system, let's do a question to apply what you've learned. A 40-year-old female patient lacks sufficient levels of a certain complement protein. She also has systemic lupus erythematosus, or lupus. She will be most susceptible to which specific pathogen or pathogens. Hopefully you noticed the main clue telling us the disease. She has lupus. Which complement-related pathology results in lupus? That would be the early complement deficiencies. And that's because in early complement deficiency, the patients lack sufficient levels of C1, C2, and or C4. And these are normally required to adequately clear immune complexes. So these patients have inappropriately high levels of immune complexes just floating around in their blood. And that's why the patients get lupus. Knowing that we're dealing with an early complement deficiency, we can answer the question, this patient will be most susceptible to which specific pathogen or pathogens? Recall that early complement deficiencies result in decreased formation of MAC, the membrane attack complex, which means a high infection rate with encapsulated organisms, specifically H. flu type B, strep pneumo, and Neisseria meningitidis. Now, if you were thinking that this patient would only be susceptible to Neisseria meningitidis, you might have been thinking late complement deficiencies. But remember that patients with late complement deficiencies are not likely to get lupus. So again, in early complement deficiencies, think of infection with all three of these encapsulated organisms. And that concludes this section.